Good evening, everyone. I'm John Lim. I'm the pastor of Calvary International Baptist Church in Taipei, Taiwan. So greetings from Taiwan. And Taiwan used to be called Formosa in the 16th century by the Portuguese. It means beautiful island. And indeed, Taiwan is very beautiful. And I have some good news personally. I became a uh, grandpa this year, and and I have a grandson, a brand new grandson named Wyatt, and very blessed, um, very thankful. And I also want to thank Pastor John Schubeck for inviting me to give tonight's message. Uh, you know, it's um, we've been to the Asia Conference for three years, and this will be our fourth one. Uh, even though it's a little different but we're all together in spirit. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for tonight that you know we can come together and to, to listen to your word. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that your Holy Spirit will open up the eyes of our heart and open up our ears, that we may listen. And Lord, be with each one, Lord, as we listen to your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I titled tonight's message as Christians, Visitors on Earth with Citizenship from Heaven. And the text is from Philippians 3. And you know, we only have temporary visas here on earth. It's temporary because our citizenship is in heaven. So let's take the first 11 verses of Philippians 3. Finally, my brethren, Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, for for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You know, we know Paul was writing this from prison in Rome. As a prisoner, he's encouraging others to have joy, to rejoice in the Lord, and to be careful not to let others, let circumstances take away that joy. You know, there's just something very cool, very different, very special about this. How does one encourage others when your circumstances are not good? When life takes your freedom away, when you can't travel anymore, when the government says you have to be stuck in your, in your own place and the government won't let you out. You know, does that sound familiar in 2020? Paul here is saying, you know, brothers and sisters, Whatever your circumstances are, you know, you tonight you might be in an unwanted, unwelcomed, and un uncontrollable situation. And your prayer is for this problem, whatever it is, to go away. And I know a lot of people today, tonight, are praying that the fires in the west coast of the United States, they're praying that it goes away. And I know a lot of people in this world, they're praying that this COVID-19 would go away because they want to go back to work. They want their kids to go back to school. You know, we 
We're, we here in Taiwan are very fortunate. You know, we never shut down. You know, the public schools never shut down. And the reason is the government and the citizens, we all work hand in hand. Of 23 million people here, there were only seven deaths. And I know one is way too many. But for 23 million and having only seven deaths, um, yes, we're very blessed here. Um, we could, our church never closed. We could do a lot of things that most other people in this world could not do. But I do know that there are a lot of people today outside of Taiwan because of uncontrolled, uncontrollable circumstances, they are very discouraged. They are very depressed because they feel life is out of control. Paul was a prisoner. He had no freedom. And he's here saying that we should encourage each other, rejoice in the Lord. Our joy is in the Lord. I mean, how could he do that? In chapter 1, we learn that Paul was confident that God, who started a work in each one of us, would finish what he started. God began a good work in you, and he will finish it. Remember when you first came to know the Lord and you just had so much joy in knowing that you were forgiven? You know, He started something new in your life and He has a good plan for your life. And God will finish what He sovereignly started. Paul understood that, that God will keep His word. And Paul, you know, um, you know he's an amazing guy. He practiced what he preached. His words and his life actions, they match. And how so important that is to have our words and our life actions to match. You know, in this chapter, in the next chapter, chapter 2, and we went over it yesterday, you know, Paul talked about how not to just pay attention to our own interests, but also for the interests of others. You know, to care about others, to encourage others. As we are in the season of COVID-19, are we encouraging others? Are we praying for others? Do we care for our friends? And the question is, you know, this, this will hit home. Are we having conversations with our husband, with our wife, with our children? Paul here in chapter 3 Verse 10 said something very, very interesting. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul wanted to know Christ. And here is the kicker. Not just to know Jesus by gaining intellectual knowledge, taking a lot of notes and reading a lot of historical books. You know, just gaining you know, more stuff in our head. Paul wanted to know Jesus experientially. He wanted to know, is the word is gnosko, to know Jesus real life in the real world sense, in real experience. He was locked up and he wanted to know Christ. Are we getting to know the Lord Jesus more intimately during this COVID-19 season? For every Christian, our knowledge of Jesus should not be arm's length, but to be gnosko, to know Christ intimately by experience and his heart to heart. You know, earlier in his life, Paul did meet Jesus on the road to Damascus. We know the story. Paul was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus to arrest Christians. Paul's background, both intellectually and religiously, was second to none. We read it. He was the Hebrew of Hebrews in a Pharisee, you know, zealous Pharisee. He persecuted the Christians. He said in Acts 22, 3 to 5, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. 
I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. From an earthly viewpoint, Paul did everything right. He learned from the best, became the Hebrew of Hebrews, and some say Pharisees of Pharisees. You know, he thought he knew it all, but something happened unexpectedly. And as time passed, Paul would say that these things that humans value, he counted them as lost as rubbish so that he may gain Christ, that he may know Jesus. So what happened? He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Acts 22, 6 to 8. Paul said, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Wow. You know, Paul, or his Jewish name, Saul, thought Jesus was dead, but he's alive? Saul was persecuting Stephen and other Christians for preaching Jesus. When Stephen was preaching, Saul was there watching, holding everyone's coats as all the others were stoning Stephen. You know, in Acts 7, 54 to 56, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen saw Jesus and Paul, or Saul, was watching Stephen going through all this. Acts 7, 57 to 60. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Verse 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness, witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Verse 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with the sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Saul saw all this. He probably was thinking, how can a man die for a Galilean carpenter who was already dead? For Saul standing there watching all this, this was, this was something very different for him. You know, he saw, and I believe he saw something very different, something that he did not have in Stephen. You know, Saul, with all his upbringings, with all his accolades, he saw Stephen getting persecuted, getting stoned, and Stephen there standing there and saying that he saw heaven open, he saw Jesus. And then, right before he died, he asked God to forgive his murderers, his killers. Saul was watching all this. And I, I believe he was thinking, how could this guy do that? We were taught to do this. Remember here in chapter 3, Paul said, concerning the righteousness, which is the law, he was blameless. You know, Paul thought he, he could do everything under the law, but he couldn't because, and, you know, he tried. Because in Romans 7, 7, he said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Now, Paul wrote about coveting. What was he coveting? I believe that Paul, and this is a side note, I believe he remembered that he coveted what Stephen had when he was getting stoned. 
the Holy Spirit was with Stephen. The love of God was with Stephen. He was willing to die for Jesus, and he even asked God to forgive his killers. Stephen saw heaven and saw this young man did not have any of what Stephen just did. He didn't have any of that. And it, I believe it made sense for Paul because you know he really struggled. I believe he struggled with what he heard because it went against everything that he was taught. Everything that it was everything against all the crowd. Everything that his teachers taught him. He was a Pharisee, but he heard it all. He saw it. So I believe that he was coveting what Stephen had. You know, I think Paul or Saul back then, he was in awe of what Stephen did. The commitment that Stephen had for Jesus. The grace that he had for all the people. The forgiveness that he had for his persecutors, his murderers. And it probably stuck on Paul's mind for a long, long time. Now on this road to Damascus, he met Jesus personally. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus did not say, why are you persecuting my people? He did not say, why did you persecute Stephen? Why are you persecuting me? When a person believes in Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus comes into that person. So when others persecute you for preaching Jesus, they're actually persecuting Jesus. So pastors, pastors, wives, and all you missionaries out there, let me tell you this, that Jesus knows your situation today. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus knows what's going on with each one of us. And Paul is reminding us today that no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what other people are saying against you or about you, if you are preaching Jesus, if you are living a life for Jesus, rejoice in the Lord. Have joy in Jesus. He knows what you're going through today. And ultimately, we are going to heaven. Paul wanted to know Jesus deeper. You know, there are times that we meet people who have this depth, this dimension of, you know, in them that that they know Jesus, you know, with this with this love, with this intimacy. You know, Susan and I had the privilege of meeting, you know, men and women from this closed country these last few years. You know, they love the Lord. And there's just this depth, this, this deepness. You know, every time we talk to them and, and they're sharing the Lord with us, just looking at their eyes. You know, it just you can just tell that they have this really close, intimate, and it's this, this relationship with Jesus that, that you don't see every day. The love, they love to share the gospel. And when they, when they share with us the, their persecution stories, and when they share with us, you know, the love they have for King Jesus, and we're just listening to them and talking to them, sharing life with them, sharing a meal with these guys. It makes me want to know Jesus deeper. I want Jesus to be the passion of my life. You know, it's just not knowing Jesus for the sake of knowing or, or even to teach about Jesus. But I want to have that, 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 that relationship that deep down inside me, I know, I know Jesus. You know, I believe you and I want to have that, that reality of knowing that inside our hearts, 
that Jesus is in us. And we represent Jesus in everything we do. That's what Paul was talking about. He wants to know Jesus. Do you want to know Jesus in that way? Do you know him passionately and intimately? Maybe a long time ago you did, but what about now? Do you still have that passion? We don't want to leave this earth. And we don't want to go to heaven and wish we had spent more time with our Lord Jesus while we're sojourning here on earth. We don't want to have any regrets of that we should have prayed more. We should have listened to Jesus more. Well, we should have shared Jesus with others more often. Paul wanted to know Jesus deeper from the depth of his heart. The only way to really know someone, and this is the only way to spend time with that person, to live with that person, to be open and to be real every day with that person. Paul said he wanted to know Jesus. He also wanted to know the power of his re resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul wanted to know the power that raised Jesus from the dead. He wanted to know the power that transformed the disciples from being so fearful of earthly things prior to the resurrection and then to become fearless people of God after the Holy Spirit came upon them. Acts 2.43 then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. These guys changed dramatically. They weren't looking around their environment and being fearful anymore. Their minds were set on heaven. Colossians 3.2 Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. We are heaven bound. And I don't want to be fearful and to live a fearful life, a defeated Christian life on earth. I don't want to keep starting over and over again and get tripped up by the same things. You know, you know every time you know, the same thing happens, I don't want to get tripped up by that again. I need, and I believe you will agree with me, that we all need to know the power of His resurrection. So the question is, do pastors and missionaries get tripped up I know Romans 7 is still there, but Paul wanted to know the power that can, that can give him victory over sin, over temptation. In order to get to Romans 8 from Romans 7, I remember Pastor Chuck said many times that we'll come to the point where we're face to face with a Jordan. And one day we need to decide to put to death the flesh and to be led by the Holy Spirit. Yes, there'll be difficulties on the other side, but the difference is that we put to death the flesh and we're led by the Holy Spirit. When we do that, we don't have to give in to anger anymore. We don't have to give in to unforgiveness anymore. We don't have to give in to you fill in the blank. When we allow the Spirit to lead us, we don't need to give in to temptation. We don't need to live that life anymore. And yes, I know I'm talking to pastors and missionaries, including myself. As Christians, we put to death the flesh, not feeding it as we are led by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's really, really hard to sin. It's really, really hard to go against what God wants to do when we are getting to know daily, when we are gnos gnosko, Jesus, in a personal way, when we get to know Jesus in a more intimate way, when we pouring our hearts to Him, having that having that heart to heart conversation, knowing that He is right there with us, it's very hard to sin. You know, when we're alone in our rooms, and I am talking to pastors and I am talking to missionaries, because this is serious when we're talking, when we're in our own room and no one is around, in front of our computer, in front of our iPhone, we need to know, we need to understand that our Lord and Savior Jesus is right there 
with us. And that's a good thing. Paul wants to know the power that can release him from old habits of doing what he knew he should not do and to do what he knew he should do. I want to know that power also. I believe you do too. The power that can uh, give me the ability to endure, to keep going, to press forward toward Jesus. The power to say yes when it should be a yes. The power to say no when it should be a no. You and I need to know the power of His resurrection. So how do I get that power to know His power? God has an unlimited supply, but why are there times that I don't or we don't have it? As pastors, as missionaries, as Christians, what have you and I been spending time on lately, especially during this pandemic? Is there something that you are doing that is keeping you, blocking you from receiving that power from our Lord? You know, a lot of us, we went through the inductive training on the Word. Uh, a lot of you, uh, most of you went through Bible college and seminary, and we know how to exegete the Word. We had the best training at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, with Pastor Chuck, with Pastor Brian, with Pastor John Corson, with Pastor uh, Don McClure, you know, when they're all together at that, that one season. And, you know, for those of us who were sitting in the pews, we thought we were in heaven. And we learned the Word of God from these godly men, and we are grateful. But now, as pastors and missionaries in a foreign land, we need not only to exegete the Word, we need to exegete ourselves. And we need to exegete the world that we live in, especially now in 2020. There are times I find myself that are, I'm very quick to criticize others, especially in this political climate. I believe we can become very orthodox and very unloving to this world today. We are so sure that we are right about everything, but are we patient with people? Are we patient toward other Christians who are going to heaven but who thinks differently than us? And are we forgiving people? If we are so sure of ourselves, why are there times we don't have this power that Paul is talking about here? We know the word, but we need to exegete ourselves also, making sure that there is nothing hindering our relationship with God. And we also need to exegete this world around us in this 2020 world that we live in, understanding that the needs of the culture, it may be tonight that God is telling you to clean up something in your life that is keeping you from His power. It may be tonight that we need to be cleansed by the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Holy Spirit, and ask God for His Holy Spirit to come upon us overflowing. It may be tonight that we need to hit the reset button and we start with loving our Lord first and to understand and to forgive and to love others who may be not lovable. Paul also said that he wants to know the fellowship of his suffering and no one in their right mind wants to suffer. But Paul understood something here. He understood that as we learn more, we learn better about ourselves, about others, about our relationship with God when we go through difficulties rather than comfort. I said this earlier, as a young man, Paul saw Stephen react in the face of death. And Stephen saw heaven and asked God to forgive others who were stoning him. And at that time, Paul did not understand that. He did not have that. But now he does. Paul wanted to know the fellowship of Jesus' suffering. Paul's attitude is, if I'm li linked with Jesus and men persecute me, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I don't care. I'm, it, his attitude is, I am ready 
to go through it because I want to know Jesus by sharing in the fellowship of his suffering. His attitude was, my allegiance is to my Savior, Jesus. And Paul, as we all know, did experience many of the sufferings. Paul wants to know Jesus, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his, of his suffering, but Paul was very real when writing this letter to the church in Philippi. Philippians 3, 12 to 16. Not that I have already attained or am ready, already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you. Verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. He was very real in saying that I have not attained this. Paul is saying that, hey, I'm not perfect. I have not reached this yet. This was Paul. I mean, the humility of this man, of what, of what he had gone through. Paul was a very humble guy. He joined in the fellowship of the suffering of Jesus. And he still said in his letter that he is pressing on, forgetting the things that are in the past and reaching forward to what's ahead. His mind, his thinking, and his focus was to press forward, the, uh, press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As I prepared this message, I was very convicted. You know, although we are very busy here at Calvary, you know, with just everyday life, but the Lord had a message for me in preparing for this message to press toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul knew he was called to serve the Lord by God. And he pressed forward to the goal. He wanted to finish well. Paul was called by God to serve. And we all know his heart was for Jesus to say to him, when Paul finishes work here on earth and enters heaven, his heart is for Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. For you and me, we need to follow Paul's example and not to be, to be stuck in the past of how great the past was. We want to see what God wants to do with us right now in the present and how he will use us for his future plans. You know, we learn from our past, but we need to focus on the present and press forward to keep going, to finish the race with our minds set on heaven. You know, heaven, Paul reminded us that we are citizens of heaven. Let's finish up the rest of the verses. So Philippians 3, 17, and I'm gonna to go to chapter four, verse one, because it fits better with the end of chapter three. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Then chapter four, verse one, therefore my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Paul here is saying, hey guys, join in following my example. You guys know my life. You've seen the pattern, pattern of life that we lived, speaking of him and Timothy. 
Why would Paul ask them to follow his example? Because Paul followed Jesus' example. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So as Christians, as pastors, as missionaries, we should follow Jesus' example. As we came to know Jesus, as we walk with Jesus daily, we are transformed more and more into the likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. For pastors, for pastors who are shepherding, shepherding local churches, we should be the living example of someone who followed Jesus, who points people to Jesus for our church. You see, Christian, the Christian life is not to be lived alone on earth. We are built for fellowship and friendship with our Lord and with our friends, with other people. The Christians in Philippi and Christians in all generations needed to see the gospel lived out in real life, lived out with real people who face the realities of everyday life, the good, the bad, and anything in between. Seeing life in action is the best way to learn and to train. We all learn by real world experience. Paul used a very interesting word, tupas, in Greek to represent, uh, it means, you know, pattern, but tupas in Greek actually means an indentation that is made by a blow of force, you know, just a hard blow. It's an indentation, a dent, it's a mark. And he used this word for the word pattern translated in English. And the question is, are you and I leaving an indentation? Are you and I leaving a mark, a pattern for others in our church to follow? Paul did that. He said, you know, follow, see these indentations? See the way we live our lives? You follow us because we're following Christ. And we, we need to do the same thing for our church. Are we leaving the indentation of God's kindness, of God's love, and of God's mercy, and of God's forgiveness, and of God's grace? I told you the Lord had a message for me in preparing this message. Message in this last session made me, you know, made my heart very, very heavy. He showed me a big, big difference, the contrast between two groups of people. Every person in this world, past, present, and future, will be in one of these two groups. One group, their destiny is destruction. The other group, their citizenship is in heaven. Two very different groups with opposite destinations. Let's look at Philippians 3, 18 and 19 again. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their building, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Paul said there are many, many in the church that are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, and they'll do their very best to take you with them. I mean, how do you and I know who's who? We need to check their integrity check to see if what they say match with what they do. I was so troubled with the word many. It reminded me of what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We all know God's heart is for all to come to Him, for none to perish. But the fact is that Jesus said this, that many will go through the wide gate with a broad way that leads to destruction. And here in chapter 3, we have Paul saying that there are many people in church, 
maybe in church leadership, enemies of the cross of Christ, and their end is destruction. This is very serious. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The principle of the cross of Christ is one of denying self. The principle of the cross of Christ is to, to, to deny myself, to crucify my, the flesh, cross over the Jordan, and to have the Spirit of God guide my life. To have the Spirit of God in me, working my life. And to say no to evil and yes to godliness. Let me repeat that, to say no to evil and yes to godliness. But if I spend my days, if I spend my daily life saying yes to evil and no to godliness, I am an enemy, I am living as an enemy of the cross that Jesus died on, the cross that has shed his blood on for my salvation. The cross is not about me, me, me. But Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the cross. Jesus gave himself up on that cross. Jesus is telling us today, let him deny himself and take up his cross. It's the narrow gate with that very difficult path, and few find it, but it leads to life. Some, some people may say, but I accepted Jesus at a crusade. There are people running around professing to be Christians because they got emotional at a message and said a prayer at a crusade, but they went home and nothing's changed. A week later, nothing's changed. A month later, nothing's changed. There's no desire to do anything of the Lord, but they go back to their old life. And some of them, some of them, because of their, of their human status, Become, they become deacons, they become elders, and then maybe they become pastors of churches. Contrast that to the person who truly accepts Jesus as Savior, as Lord. Something happened to their heart. Something changed on the inside that was not there before. They will be identified by the fact that they're hungry for God. They want, they're hungry to do the will of God. They want to come to prayer meetings. They want to go to Bible studies. I remember at Costa Mesa when they had services every night of the week and you just can't get enough of it. It's a step-by-step -step process where their desires, desires change from this earthly world to God's world to heaven. Their life's actions are recalibrated to God-centered from me-centered. They never really cared about what God cared about before, but after meeting Jesus with the Holy Spirit in them, they cared. All that's changed. They pleased themselves before, before God and before the Holy Spirit came in, but now they want to do what's pleasing to the Lord. You know, just as an apple tree would produce apples, Christians who have the Holy Spirit of God in them, in Him, will produce the fruit of the Spirit. They will love, and two attributes, you know, two of the attributes of love is joy and peace. They'll have joy, they'll have peace. As I look at the world today, and as I exegete myself, and I, and I exegete the world, and I see the patience of God, the love of God for me, a sinner, you know, and, and I, I see the patience of God for all of us, but I am troubled by certain aspects of church life. Don't assume eloquence, a great speaker, is godliness. Or the capacity to do things with lights and music is godliness. Even casting out demons, doing miracles, and, and you know, that these people are in Christ. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Watch out for false teachers. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus said, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, false teachers will look like true teachers. You know, they, 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 they'll look like true teachers because they want to, to, to fool, to trick the majority. Only they can't fool those people who are truly studying the Word of God. They have the Word of God in them. You know, I had a class in the Sheriff's Department many years ago learning about co um, counterfeit currency. You know, what do they do? Do they give us a lot of counterfeits to look at? No. They gave us the real bills in all its forms. And we, we, we learn and we get to know the real so well that if anything fake comes, we know immediately. We need to know the Word of God. We need to go back to the basics. We need to walk so close to the living Word that, that anyone who shows up, we immediately know, will know if something is wrong. We need to have that sensitivity that the Holy Spirit, uh, of what the Holy Spirit is telling us if something is not right. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are wolves. So you can't tell from the outside but by their fruits, you'll recognize them. So it's not how they dress or how God's blessed them with a lot of earthly stuff. It's not by their gifts, not by their words, not by their wisdom, not by the size of their church, not by these huge outreaches. It's none of that stuff. It's by their fruits, you'll recognize them. We check out their lifestyle. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, does that shock you? It shocks me. It kind of makes me tremble that Jesus would say this. Not all who profess faith will be going to heaven. That means there's going to be people who are saying, I'm a Christian. I accepted Jesus. But they're not. They're not Christian. Not all who profess faith will be there, including church leaders. They may have all the right Christian language. I mean, they may know all the Christian, the current Christian talking points, but if we read the Bible carefully, not all will be there. Jesus said it, and Paul said it here in chapter 3. You see, Paul did not take this lightly. He was weeping when he was saying this. Paul's heart was a shepherd's heart. He wanted to protect his people. He was saying this to warn, but his heart was very broken. I can even picture Paul dictating this, and maybe Timothy was writing this down. For many walk of whom I often told you, and maybe Paul just stopped, and he started to shed tears, and he cried, and maybe Timothy was just waiting for Paul to compose himself, but Paul was weeping. And then because of what the Holy Spirit is telling him to say next, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul made these claims with big tears. And I'm thinking myself, do I cry for people who do not know Jesus? How about you? Do you pray for people? Do you pray for your loved ones who do not know Jesus? Do you pray for your family, for people at work? Or for people in your community not to become enemies of the cross of Jesus do you weep over them in front of the Lord I mean do we still do that in 2020 we need to cry we need to care we need to pray we need to forgive before we preach we need to speak truth in love our names are in the book of life in heaven. How would people know that we are citizens of heaven? By being cool and doing what everyone else in this world is doing? No. The only way people will know that we are citizens of heaven is that we live the life that matches what the Word of God tells us. If God calls it evil, we call it evil. If God calls it good, 
We call it good. We do not call evil good or good evil. Let's keep our eyes up. We are waiting for Jesus' return. This world does not even know or understand that Jesus came in the first place. He came already. They don't even understand that. But we know that and we should live like it. Jesus is coming back. We tell people about the good news of Jesus, but our gaze should be watching, should be looking up, watching for his return. Brothers and sisters, we are servants of Jesus, visiting this earth for a season only. It's one life. Our citizenship is in heaven. We press forward. We stand fast. We stand firm in the Lord. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And I, I thank you that, Jesus, you're returning. You're coming back. And help us to just know you better, Lord, while we're here. Not to waste any time. Be with each one. Be with each pastor. Be with each missionary. Be with their families. Bless them. Guide them, Lord. And until we meet again, may you just fill them with your Holy Spirit. We pray the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, God bless you, and may the Lord keep you. And I, and I, you are welcome to come to Taiwan anytime. And I just uh, want to thank you for this opportunity to share with you tonight. God bless you.